Well, there's some familiar names coming through. We'll just give it a few more minutes just to um, let people join. anyone know any good jokes <laughs> we'll just let a few more people in I think before we start I was just telling the um, penless um, Kira I'm Jill from Parliamentary Library we've got a function on at Parliamentary at Parliament tomorrow at from 12 to 1 um, you're welcome to come along to kind of reopen the grounds again um, there'll be some ceremony and some food um, should be good fun Right. Do we make a start or should we give it a couple more minutes? What do people think? Make a start? Yeah, okay. So, okay. Kia ora koutou everyone. Um, welcome to the session on reference request tracking, the good, the bad and the ugly. Um, I'm Jo Rusk, I'm co-convener of the SLIS committee and I think we'll start proceedings with a karakia. Um, e te hui, baia te mataranga kia marama, Ki wai taki nā mahi katoa, tu mai tu kaha, aroha atu, aroha mai, tato i a tato katoa. So welcome. And the plan for the session today is we'll have three short presentations showing different approaches that some libraries have taken to their research request tracking. Um, first will be Jill Taylor from Parliamentary Library. And Jill will wave at us, go hello. <laughs> and secondly, it will be Dirk Anderson from Simpson Grierson. And there's Dirk, hello. And then the third speech will be from me, Jo Russ from the Police Library. And then after those three presentations, we can then just have questions and discussion and share ideas around what is a tricky issue for most of us. And um, not just, you know, managing the requests itself, but also deriving meaningful analytics without losing the will to live. So um, that's the challenge for all of us. And, you know, if you have any thoughts or questions or anything you want to share as we go through, pop them in the chat and, you know, we can have a good discussion after the presentation. So I think without further ado, I'll hand over to Jill, who will share her screen and um, take it away, Jill. Thank you, Joe. I just let me focus. I can can only talk, can't talk and do it at the same time. I will um, you all see that? Cool. Um Kira Kota ko Jill Taylor Tokoingua. Um I'm one of the research services manager at Parliamentary Library to Pataka Rangahau. Um just to give you background, you're probably familiar with us, but we respond to requests from MPs and their staff, and we also provide parliamentary information and services to the public. Handle about 8,000 internal requests a year and about 1,500 public requests on top of that. Um, all up in the library, we've got about 46 staff with about 30 people working in the research team, which is the people that mostly use the request tracking system that we've got. Um, so we use software called ServiceNow. I think it's originated in America and we brand it as a tier online. Um, I think it was an originally kind of an IST ticketing system and it was pitch, the software license was purchased for the whole of parliamentary service. And so our IST team uses it. It's also used for publicity requests because we have a process where um, MP staff have to get approval to um, put ads out and so the requests for those are used through the system and it will be soon used for our communications request as well as library requests and information management requests. So it's not a system that was specifically designed for reference requests or research requests um, and we've kind of adapted it to our needs somewhat. We've got a customer portal that's available through our house, and this is what people see when they go through to it. Um, and then the next slide is kind of a bit of a 
shot of how people can put requests into the library through the portal. They don't have to put requests into us through the portal, they can just still email us as well. And we probably only really get about 20% of requests coming through this, this way. Um, but it is building up over time. One of the advantages of this system is that the emails are sucked directly into the system, so we don't have to do any kind of manual entering. Um, and this is kind of what it looks like from the back end when we get a request. And so there's some information about who puts the request in and then who's it going to be assigned to. And this area here is where the details of the requests will be. Um, this is kind of one of the views that we um, can see. We've created multiple dashboards and Save Search is providing different views. Um, this, I'm just showing you public requests at the moment because we keep our internal requests um, confidential. We can add and remove columns, we can dis and display them in different orders. So it's really quite <clears throat> versatile in terms of the display and the options that you've got. We can track which requests requests are unassigned, how many requests each person is working on, how long requests take, all that kind of information. Um, this is one of the dashboards we've created. There again, oh, sorry, I'll just go back. There again, we've got lots of different dashboards. I won't show you um, some of them. I kind of <clears throat> can't really show you because we've got kind of client information on them, but this is tracking numbers of requests coming in, so on a daily basis, on a week, and then the time we're spending on them. Um, but we can also track client usage in terms of um, numbers of requests from different offices and how many requests individuals in the team are doing. Um, so it's got really good kind of analytics functions. Um, this is a type of report we just produce in the house for our team, which just gives some kind of figures around numbers of requests we're receiving, which people in the team are quite interested in. I fear to say we don't do a lot of reporting upwards to our ELT. We do do, we just started doing service promise reporting, and we do do some kind of quite high level reporting on that. In terms of um, key performance indicators, we look at regular use, so repeat usage. So how many people are using us um, once a year? How many people are using us five times a year? How many people are using us more? So we we think that repeat business is quite a good measure of seeing um, a kind of a quantitative value um, performance measure, but also a bit kind of qualitative as well. Um, I guess in terms of the advantage of service now, as I said, the emails pull in automatically into the system. The internal, through the portal, the internal customers can view the previous, re the previous requests, because we used to get lots of requests for people saying, I think you did this request for us in the past, but I can't find it in my email. And this way they can go into the portal and they can just see all their requests quite easily. As I said, it's got really good dashboards and reporting and analytics. And for each request, there'll be an audit trail showing what's happened with the request. So if someone's away, we can kind of really quickly tell where they're at with it and what's being sent to the client. And for our parliamentary service customers, it's a kind of a one-stop shop because it's got this aspect of they can put their ICT requests and all their other types of requests. So they're not having to go to different parts of the system to to talk to different teams within parliamentary service. A um, couple of disadvantages, I guess, as I said, it wasn't specifically designed for research requests, and so we've kind of had to adapt it a bit. And because it's a kind of an organisation-wide system, any changes that we want to make um, can take a wee while sometimes to, to get through. But, um, but largely, we, we're quite liking it. We used to use Microsoft Dynamics CRM as our request tracking system and happy to talk about that in the discussion if anyone's interested as well. Yeah, it's kind of me, I think. Um, 
I'll stop sharing for now. Thank you, Jill. Um, that's, yeah, it looks pretty swish, actually. Um, I'd like to hand over to Dirk Anderson now to talk about what happens in the world of Simpson Greeson. I think you're on mute, Dirk. Shall we try that now? Much better, excellent. Thank you for your patience. Jill, that was quite a piece of software. It was quite impressive to see the uh, results and graphs coming out of that. Okay, can you see my uh, PowerPoint screen there? You can, splendid, I'll plow straight into it. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm talking about reference request tracking at Simpson Grierson. In terms of what I'm going to cover today, I'll talk a little bit about who we are and why we track. I'll spend a little bit of time talking about the actual system that we use. And then I'll also cover off some of the advantages and disadvantages of that system. I'll reflect on three tracking takeaways for you to consider. And then I'll finish off really quickly on the reporting side of things. So about us and why we track. Simpson Gresson, we're a New Zealand law firm. We're fairly large with 300 odd staff. We're a full service firm, which means we work across a wide range of civil legal practice areas. That means the firm requires quite a fair bit, of quite varied research to be done. So who does that work? Well, we empower our lawyers to do their own research work. And of course, our own library research services team, five people are also there to help. So for us, our reference request tracking system is a central conduit that we use to manage our reference work within our research services team. Why do we use it? Well, I guess as a tool, it helps us to record almost all incoming requests so that no requests are missed. It helps us to allocate work amongst the team so work is fairly allocated, hopefully leading to better quality work. And we also use it to record our answers, firstly, so that we know work is actually completed and sent. And also so that the answer can potentially use, be used again in the future. So how do we track? Oops. Bit of a technical area here. Here we are. How we track. So uh, we use Microsoft Outlook. We've created an email account that we call Reference with its own email address, which all our ref research services team can view, and in addition to our own email accounts. So we've also got a dedicated reference phone number. So we advertise that reference email address and that phone number to our lawyers, and we encourage them to submit their queries those ways. We may also receive incoming requests in other ways, and those queries are documented and emailed or otherwise forwarded to our reference email account inbox. In this way, we have one centralized location where all of our incoming uh, research requests can be seen by all the library staff. Second, we allocate scheduled times during the working week where a librarian, let's call them the duty librarian, monitors that reference inbox and telephone phone number. And for the time that they're on duty, it's their job to triage incoming requests. In triaging those incoming research requests, the duty librarian either commits to answering each incoming question themselves or negotiates with colleagues for them to pick up the work.
So here's an example I've created with fake jobs and fake people of how our reference inbox can look and work. You can see incoming requests, and on the right-hand side is a categories column. It's a column where you can assign one or more colors to an email. Each staff member has their own color, and that color can be named. In this image, you can see a number of incoming re requests that came in yesterday, and is also at the top a yet unread job that requires emergent attention. Uh, when a research request is completed, sent to the client, usually by email, the e email is also CC'd into the reference inbox together with the uh, librarian's colour. Now, our team discussed our reference inbox and how it works last week, and a couple of things came out of that conversation. We noted that it would be helpful if finished jobs are cleared out of the reference inbox promptly once fully completed, which leaves the inbox looking clean and crisp with only live jobs in there, so it's much clearer to see what's going on. Secondly, the handover time from one duty librarian to the next is an important time. In addition to best practice in terms of what's read, what's unread, what's got colours against it and what hasn't, it's really important those to communicate to uh, be aware of any urgent work that needs to be coming up. In terms of our system that we've got, well, as you can see, it's pretty simple. Um, it costs us nothing, takes little time for any of us to administer, and it uses a tool outlook that we've already got. It's quite visual. Everybody in the team can see and understand in a visual way if there's new unread and unallocated work that might need action. It can highlight in a fairly general sense the current research workloads of each team member. And by keeping items in a completed folder, that subfolder can act as a searchable knowledge base that can help us with similar queries. Also, by keeping those um, work in the in reference inbox in a completed folder, clients sometimes follow up and they want us to resend the work to them or they ask for related work to be done. And in, anyone in our team can quickly find and forward on our response again, or do any follow-up work as required. So most reference tracking is really only one part of doing re reference work. Um, for us, managing that tracking well certainly helps us to earn and keep our customers trust and confidence in our service. In terms of what our tool is not, well, it's not foolproof. There's potential for incoming requests to be unintentionally deleted or allocated jobs to be moved to the completed folder without the answer being sent. It's email based, so it perhaps doesn't effectively capture other work that might be delivered in other ways, such as face to face or by phone. It's probably not the best tool in the world for managing complex queries that may require the input of several library staff over a large amount of time. And of course, because that email inbox is public to everyone in the research services team, any hush-hush jobs requiring confidentiality between the client and a specific library staff member need to be managed outside of the system. Three key takeaways that I'd like to share with you. I guess for us, for this system to work successfully, You've got to have staff buy-in so that everyone that interacts with the tool needs to know why it works and why they should follow all the processes all the time. Second, reference tracking is really only one part of our research process and it's not an end in itself. I'd still suggest that other parts of the research work that we do for example, conducting effective reference interviews right at the start of a query and creating a tailored response that delights a client, they're all equally or more important part of the process. So keep it all in context. Third and last, I'd suggest that our solution, our solution that we've got, it's modest, but it, it works for us and it might result in better outcomes for us than perhaps a more complex solution that's poorly implemented. Um, 
your reality might well be different. So do what works for you. Finishing off with some of our reporting. That's a bit of a less of a focus for me, to be honest. Like the slide says, I do much of reporting with quantitative and qualitative data. That said, I think there's a fair amount of opportunity here to improve our reporting that we do, uh, to really answer those kind of so what and who cares kind of questions, and to really show how our research positively impacts the work that our legal teams do. So I've got a lot more to learn here, so I'm looking forward to hearing uh, what our speakers have said and also what you think. Thank you very much for your time. All right, thanks, Dirk. That's um, really interesting. So it's my turn now to share with you what we do at New Zealand Police Library. So I will now attempt to share my screen. So be with me while I do that. Right, can everyone see that? Hopefully, cool. So yes, um, how do we do it at our place? Um, right. So, right. So at the New Zealand Police Library, we used to record very basic information about the reference, reference requests we'd received in just a Word document. Um, you know, we'd record the date, the basic query, who asked for it, and how many hours we spent. Um, and so it was very, very basic, and um, a lot of manual effort required to produce any meaningful reporting from it. And I would spend hours every six months trying to massage this into something that would be a halfway decent report from management. Um, and we were actually really, really keen to take up a Lumen, which is like the companion product to our Liberty 5 library system. But it sort of became apparent that we were never going to get funding for that. So, you know, for a proper tool. So we decided to go down the do-it-yourself route and um, made a massive improvement on this basic, you know, Word document approach by creating a Kai research request bib type in our Liberty 5 system. And this bib type's hidden from the end users in the OPAC, it's just something at the moment that the Kai team can, you know, the library team can see in the background. Um, so, you know, that's sort of how we've done the DIY, no cost, low cost approach to it. And so here's a sample of what one of, this is a mock-up record, obviously, so, you know, like Jill can't show customer information. Um, so this is a screenshot of the kind of information that we capture in our research request bib type. And it's a mix of existing fields that we use for cataloging all the various stuff we put in our catalog, but also some new user defined fields. So that, you know, it captures the information we need and means that, you know, we can use our LMS as our um, tracking tool. And uh, there's only three of us in the police library. So it's not like we're a massive team that we're trying to coordinate because obviously Jill, Jill's operation is a massive scale. This is um, a small three people. And so um, this, you know, is such an improvement on what we used to do. Um, we set it up in February last year, and it didn't actually take that much time at all to set up. And we haven't actually time to retrospectively go back and put in any of our earlier requests, but even with what we've built up in there since the beginning of last year, it's becoming a really handy knowledge base for us in the first instance when um, people ask, often ask for the same things over and over again or a variation of the same thing. So this is a tool for the library team to actually, you don't have to start reinventing the wheel from scratch every time. You can, And you can sometimes go, oh, here's the search we prepared earlier, and then we'll do a follow-up search. And so it's quite a good way to save a time for us. And what we do is we attach the search results listing that we've sent to people in there. And we also, um, if they've put in a reference request form, because we do have a form, but not everyone fills it out, um, we attach the request form as well. So that all the information around, you know, like the conversation and all the strands of the request are captured in the one record as attachments. So we, and we, you know, we put in the detail and then we put in the answer, we call it that the abstract. And then also if we get feedback, we put feedback in as well. So we've got all that information in one place to look up. And um, in terms of reporting, 
we I've set up a custom report that exports out the relevant metadata out of it so that I can do a monthly report. And I still have to do a bit of faffing around to make it look good, but at least the information's kind of more easily extractable. Um, so there's still a ways for us to go in terms of our analytics and reporting. Um, but, you know, when you don't have any funding for a proper, proper product, um, we're still pretty pleased with what we've managed to do with, you know, just from our own back and just with our existing library system. Um, but we are really, really keen to hear how other libraries tackle the reporting side of things, um, you know, when they don't have a commercial tool at their disposal. So um, that's it for me, short and sweet. But if anyone else who uses Liberty would like to know more about maybe this could be an approach that could work at their place, happy to talk offline, you know, in any detail about, you know, how we did it. So, yeah, just, you know, get in touch. So, um I'll stop sharing now and we'll be able to open up for discussion. And yeah, let's see what we've all got to share. So has anyone got any questions or thoughts or don't be shy. <laughs> Hi, it's Nina here from ACC. Let me put the video on. Come on, start. Why won't it do? There we go. Hello. <laughs> hey, I'm from ACC. We do not have a lot of requests for our corporate library as such. We do have one. It is sitting in boxes in Iron Mountain, which adds some, its own challenges. So <laughs> if anybody wants anything, we have to request it from there. But most of our requests, whether internal or external, which we don't have very many, but most of our requests from our people, um, which could be claims managers or those reviewing claims, whatever, will be for external content like medical journals and the like. So most of our requests will come through EBSCO and we use the OCLC wheelchair to get access to those journals if we're not already subscribed. So we don't exactly have the same issues because we don't have very much with our own library, and we are currently working on that, we just created a list in SharePoint in a form that people can fill in, pops it into the list in SharePoint, and uh, advises the information management team, of which there's three of us at the moment, out of, should be five, but there's only three, and we just get notified if there's a request in there and we'll action it. And that list keeps tracking that we've seen to, and when we want it to come back and who's got it. So. So we just use a SharePoint list because I set it up and I'm familiar with SharePoint. So that's how it ended up that way. So that's basically what we do. But um, I can't really show it to you. But if somebody wants to talk to me about just doing a simple list in SharePoint, then I'm more than happy to talk to them about that. I, I've got a question. Um, we often have debates about time spent on requests. Um, Dirk might remember these. Dirk used to work with us. Um, this is the number of requests and, and you know, I'm looking at both of them and the challenges we find with time spent is it can be a little bit subjective in terms of um, it's often a post the request, someone's sitting there thinking, oh, how long did I spend on it? Maybe it was a couple of hours, maybe it was three hours. Um, also, it's kind of dependent on what else people have on at the time, how complex the request was and, and their kind of experience level and how they and their kind of um, working style, I guess. And so there's a whole lot of factors that go into that time spent um, category. What we're finding overall is our request numbers are going down, but the time spent on requests is going up a bit. And, and one of the points of view is that that means the requests are more complex. But, you know, I just wondered if, if other people had kind of encountered those challenges and if they have any perspectives on it. Um, yes, it's Erin from Mint Allison Robots here. Um, so we are a law firm as well. Um, so it was really interesting to hear the um, hear from the others. Um, we've also found that complex requests are on the increase. Um, 
I think just because there's so much out there now <laughs> um, with it being online. Um, so what we have tried to do is communicate that to the stakeholders and to the firm um, and kind of just in that saying that most of our requests now take over 60 minutes. Um, so we are a small team with nearly three um, FTEs. I've got a few part-timers, including myself. Um, so this was also one of my thoughts too, was that we, um, a lot of effort is put into um, recording these stats, but is, uh, you know, and uh, with the reporting, but is that really telling the story and demonstrating our value? And I don't know if it is. We used to do monthly reporting here um, using an Excel spreadsheet and then creating fancy graphs and send it to um, to the director. Um, but I, I don't think that does do justice for all the work that we that we do and explain the complexity. So we're still trying to work out how we can, I guess, communicate more about our value. And this is something we've talked about in different library um, library meetings. So what we are also trying to do here is enter our time. Um, so lawyers record their time in six minute, um, six minute lots. So we are using now the um, time recording system. Um, and so some of that will get billed if it's appropriate to a client, but the majority is um, not billed because that's why it's sent, sent to our team. Um, but we are in that system recording the time. So we do have a non-charge code too so we're using that system that's already in the firm that's talking that language that you know the finance team use um, and that the partners use um, so that's working well um, also we um, are using in teams planner um, so just to kind of organize the workload really so we don't pop too much information in there but because we've got um, Four part timers in our in our team. It's a quite an easy way to, you know, drop in the the name of the request, who when it's due by, um, someone can assign it in progress, and you've kind of got that that there. Um, it doesn't mean you're coming in and out of systems a bit, but we again haven't. Yeah, I guess um, you know wanted to spend too much money on um, on creating another system. I was really interested to see ServiceNow because um, the IT team uses that internally. So it was really great to see how, how that works. Um, and all our completed research requests are um, saved into our document management system as well. So we can, we use iManage, so we can search those as well. So we, we use that as our knowledge, knowledge tool. Um, but yeah, I guess, has anyone, I guess, you know, got some ideas on how we can communicate that value without perhaps bombarding people with <laughs> three or four pages or even two pages of, of graphs. Like how, how, can we, how can we tell our story more? It's the challenge, isn't it? You know, um, you know we have found because, I mean, if you're looking for qualitative measures then you need to be doing surveys and there's a limit to how much the client customers want to be surveyed all the time and how often they'll respond but I guess that's why we think that um, repeat usage is quite a good measure because it does show that people are kind of coming back to us they're not just using us once but they're continuing to use us and that's the, um, we found that a, a, a useful thing that they are ELT can, it's, a, it's quite a simple measure and it's easy to kind of understand, I think. Yeah. I think with Erin, I think it, the number of people or how often it can be a good measure, but I, I like the idea of the time. I'm not a trained librarian. And in fact, I'm trying to find an article, being very naughty, I'm trying to find an article and I can't find it. <laughs> I'm handing on because I'm still learning how to go about doing the research and finding particular things. So I think the time taken is probably quite relevant, um, particularly if you're finding they're taking longer, because I know for us, a sale of ours comes from other 
published journals, medical journals in there, which means we don't always have a subscription. So then I have to go and find a library that has it that I can go in and to loan it from or get a copy from. So it can be quite time consuming to, to do that. And it's that value that you add is to, and then it also helps identify how important is that. If I go back and say, we can only get it from overseas, it's gonna cost you X amount of US dollars plus whatever, Sometimes they'll come back and say, oh, no, we'll get it another way. <laughs> or they say, oh, well, we can use this article instead. So it can also have that sort of effect. But say at ACC, it probably is a little bit different in that we're using a, perhaps a lot more external resources. I'll shut up now. <laughs> I can speak for myself at um, the WSP library. Um, I'm a solo librarian for WSP New Zealand, so I've got approximately 2,000 engineers. Um, so I'm a one, one woman band. Uh, we use uh, a SharePoint based database uh, portal that uh, I've been mainstreaming requests to. Um, so uh, previously people were used to just being able to send an email, but to help mainstream um, a sense of how many people are in fact using it, making sure that data is available in one place. So Erin, for me, this is probably the best way I, I have to do it, um, is making sure all requests go through the portal. Um, and it just means that I can then take a look at how many requests I have over a particular period. Um, our library dates back to the days of Ministry of Works. So that's going back away. And there used to be about a dozen employees in the library. Um, so, you know, back in the golden years. Um, but uh, what it means is that you've got a lot of fresh blood who don't know we have a library don't know the information center is here and I've been working on promoting that um, one of the things I've also been working on promoting is copyright compliance which means that I've been trying to break the habits around oh don't worry about it I'll find another way to get it I'm like no that's what I'm here for that's why we have certain subscriptions you know, if I can't get it for you you can't get it basically without breaking copyright um, but we do have certain external subscriptions. I've been relying heavily on certain interloan relationships. Um, but, you know, it's, it's the way we see it is this is a, huge, a hugely essential tool for quite a few of our more senior engineers who, among those who've been using it for the last 20, 30 years, have really felt that it's the big difference between us and some of the other companies uh, in that we have that service available to us. Um, it's interesting trying to uh, balance all those things. So in terms of uh, uh, registering the time, um, I don't keep track of every single hour that I do per se, per, per um, request. But if, for example, I've been asked to come in and support the research team on a bid or a particular project, then I get that cost center and I've got a certain number of hours I can charge to that. And that's going to show up in my timesheet. My timesheet will show how many hours I've spent working on ad administration versus searches, that kind of thing. Um, but I don't do search by search unless it's one of those cases where I'm charging them uh, for the project. But um, it is, uh, generally speaking, um, mostly reference work at the moment. Um, we do have a new library system that we rolled out in October, which is also Liberty version five. Um, so that's been kind of fun and I'm still learning to navigate some of that. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's, that's, that's all I've got to add, really. <laughs> I think for us, um, that whole thing about what do you report and what's important. Yeah, I think everyone has this idea that you can have this amazing, wonderful monthly KPI report that is just, you know, one page and it just shows the world everything that you do and how amazing it all is. But it's actually really hard to, to achieve. And that whole thing about 
the tracking how long you spend on something versus you know the volume of requests we kind of track those two things because it's quite an interesting comparison for us um that we get a one particular team we get a high volume of requests from them but they're not necessarily complex ones whereas sometimes a lot of our time is taken on a small number or a few work groups that really have those more meaty complex kind of requests but it is an interesting thing to track over time when it changes and also when someone leaves because suddenly you don't hear from that team anymore and you're thinking oh, what's going on here and for us you know organization of 14,000 people yeah there's a lot of people that don't know there's a library <laughs> and that's yeah um but and how much more busy do we want to get though as well as the other question you have to worry about but I think anything that you can show the value in who you're providing the value to is useful to have ready to go when you get asked those sort of questions from people that don't necessarily use libraries or understand the value of it so for us it's kind of like you know it's hang, being there ready to go if you get that challenge yeah. which sometimes comes up yeah well, one of the things I've been doing to further spread the word is um, occasionally hosting a lunchtime session around 101, how to use the information center, what that looks like, what service I provide, um, you know, and very much the mantra I'm trying to get into people's heads is when in doubt, ask Tal, um, you know, because if I don't know the answer, I'll find it. Uh, to the best of my ability. But the idea is to get people to think about it, to get people to, to come to me. And um, I've got the advantage of, I'm part of, I, I'm one of uh, the addresses on the list of people who get informed when you get new staff coming on board. So I've got a sense of who's coming in. And then I know sort of which teams to talk to about, I know you've got so many, you know, this X number of new people, let me, you know, let's have a conversation. Let me do a 101 session. I've reached out to the HR team to say, hey, the welcome pack should include slightly more updated information on what this looks like. Um, I'm, yeah, so I'm, I'm all around making a bit of a nuisance of myself. Um, you know, so it's, yeah, it, it is a combination of trying not to be overwhelmed, but also um, spreading the word as much as possible and to me while no I don't want to be overwhelmed if I get overwhelmed it proves my point that I need someone else in the library as well as myself and that it shouldn't just be a one-person show um, so you know there's th there are varying degrees of complexity sometimes it's just a matter of purchasing an article sometimes it's a big research project and I actually find that the combination of the two helps prove uh, to anyone who who needs it um, of the the multifaceted ways that the information services can the information center can actually support the company um, and the fact that I get to work with a diverse group of of teams is really what keeps it interesting it's just nice to see something on the chat um see Simmons Auckland libraries about is there any free um, or cheap um, systems I, I do not know of any <laughs> sorry is anyone else um, no that's why we went down the DIY like what have we got you know at our disposal that we can use in yeah you know and because at least with the Liberty system you can do your own stuff in it you can create you, you know so have to talk to you, Tal, if you want some more help with Liberty and some of the other things that we do with our Liberty system, because, you know, that's, you know, that's what we can make changes ourselves to. It's kind of, yeah, use your autonomy where you, you can. Yeah. But no, I don't think there is anything free. I mean, yeah. But I mean, interesting if anyone else out there has um, stumbled across something, yeah, let us know. Yeah, I did wonder if there was anything in Koha, but um, Casey's saying not, not as flash as yours, Joe. Yeah, the thing with Koha, with it being open source, um, because in a previous job, I um, I was part of the uh, team that did the rollout for it. The great thing with Koha is it is open source, but the 
potential downside is that if you want to bespoke it in any way, if you want to tweak or fix anything, you're paying for it um, every single time. Whereas, you know, I, I, I don't know with a lot of other um, packages, my, my experience has been with Koha and more recently with Liberty. Um, I'm, I'm not sure about free systems though. Koha is great because it's open sourced, but it depends whether you're willing to live with things that haven't been um, changed or fixed yet, or whether you're willing to spend the money and be the person who basically contributes to the community by, by funding that, that tweak. Does anyone else want to say anything or got any thoughts or feelings? Otherwise, you know, we can finish early and go and have a cup of coffee. But yeah, just, you know, speak now or forever hold your peace. Thank you very much. This is my first time attending, so I found it very interesting. Thank you. Cool. Well, what we'll do then is... Um, just, yeah, we'll let you go early. Your class can be dismissed. Um, but um, I'd just like to do a quick plug for the SLIS committee before you go, captive audience and all that. Um, you know, you don't have to be a Wellington-based librarian to join our committee, because obviously these days it's all, everything's all virtual. So, but we'd really like to have some new people on board. You know, it's always good to get new ideas and um, we meet every couple of months. So um, if you'd like to get an invite to our next um, committee meeting, just even to just join in as a guest no obligation to join um let me know and we'll get you in there um so um and the other thing too is any other feedback on other topics you know what are your burning issues that you'd like us to cover so we can do more sessions like this get, feed those through as well and then that way, way we can make plan events and um sessions that will be really relevant to our um, members um so thank you to Jill and Duke for um, sharing your stories today. It was really, really interesting that, you know, different organisations have different approaches and um, different sized teams. And um, hope to see everyone at our next event. Um, so I'll close with a karakia and then, yeah, we'll see you next time. Una hia, una hia, una hia ki te uru tapu nui, ka wataya, ki a mama, te nakau, te tinana, te wairua, i te ara takata, Koi e te rongo, whakairia, aki ki ranga, kia tina, tina hue, takie. Thanks everyone. Bye.